Welcome to Living Hope Podcasts with Dr. Peter McLuhan teaching on the sayings of Jesus. Join us in our worship center to hear greater works. In my view, today's saying is one of the most challenging and yet inspiring sayings that Jesus ever made. Jesus came to show us how God uses people who live in a close relationship with him. Jesus always sees more in us than we see in ourselves. He consistently stretched his followers to do greater things than they thought were ever possible to do. Can you imagine when Jesus said, heal the sick and cleanse the leper, and all 12 looked around and said, who, me? And yet they did it. I assure you, Jesus sees more in you than you see in yourself. Today, an invitation is being extended to all who are listening to this message to rise into the greater works that Jesus has prepared for his followers to do. The word greater is found over 82 times in the Bible. It's an invitation from God to greatness. I believe the Father has greater works for our church to walk in. I'm looking forward to the greatest decade of ministry in my life. Shortly after I turned 60, I was invited to teach on the book of Isaiah to a gathering of refugees in Turkey. During that experience, something new happened for me in ministry. For the first time, all of the elements of moving in the supernatural came together. People were healed. People were set free from demons. The participants felt empowered to move in the supernatural. While I was saying to myself, God, why did it take me so long to arrive here? That moment fueled all the things that I've learned over the last 10 years and all the growth that has taken place in my life to move in the supernatural and to teach others to do the same. Now, I'm more certain at age 70 than I was at age 60 that there were still greater works for me to do over the next decade. As we study the sayings of Jesus, I believe that you will discover there are greater works waiting for you to experience. Listen to what Jesus said. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. John chapter 14, verse 12. Remember that these words are in the collection of sayings of Jesus' last words just before he was arrested. These are the sayings that he especially wanted his disciples to embrace. Jesus began the saying with an unusual attention getter. Truly, truly, or as in some of the older English versions, verily, verily, I say to you, some explanation about this verily, verily will be helpful to us. 30 times in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, truly or verily, just once, truly I say to you. In John's Gospel, 25 times Jesus uses the double, truly, truly, or verily, verily, I say to you. Jesus is the only person in the New Testament to speak this way. So what does truly, truly, or verily, verily mean? What should we take away from this? It's actually an old Hebrew word meaning amen. Usually amen comes at the end of a sentence. When somebody says something amazing and we're stirred inside, people say amen. When Jesus begins by saying, truly, truly, I say to you, he is, in effect, amening himself. What I'm saying is true, whether you agree or don't agree. I am amening what I just said before I say it. I'm certain that what I'm about to say is so true that there's no need for you to argue with me. By my own authority, I am certifying that what I've said to you is true. Jesus certainly knew 
He needed to do that because there are plenty of people, including me, who have not accepted this statement as being true, let alone even being possible. I've always thought of this saying as poetry and not to be taken literally. When someone says something that we think is outrageous and not possible, don't you say under your breath, yeah, right. By that we mean we don't believe that anyone could do something like that. Jesus prepared us for a human reaction by saying, before you say no, I'm saying yes. This is true of my followers. Most pastors talking about the saying of Jesus try to water it down by suggesting that with today's technology, we can reach more people than Jesus ever reached during his whole lifetime. While that is true, it's not the primary intent of what Jesus said. Listen again to his exact words. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works I do. He didn't ask you your opinion. He gave you a statement of identity. It's who you are. There's no getting around it. Jesus believes that we can do what he did. It is important to clarify to whom Jesus was speaking and why he said these words to them. While the saying was addressed to his disciples, it applies to every follower of Jesus. He said, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. That's been working on me because I always knew that he said this to the apostles. They were special people with special privileges. So it can't possibly apply to me. Jesus said this to the apostles because he needed them to believe that their main task was to teach the new followers of Jesus to do what Jesus did. Pastors need to model for people how to do what Jesus did. So often in this category, we have pastors saying, don't do what I do, do what I say, because they don't have stories to tell of people being healed. Further, pastors need to have the deep conviction that Jesus expects all of his followers to do what he did. Not in a sense of duty, but in the sense of the pure joy of miracles flowing out of your life and doing what you never thought was possible to do. The saying is for everyone who follows Jesus. If you've received Jesus as your Savior, this word is for you. It does not require formal training or a professional title. In fact, those are the least likely people. They're educated beyond their ability and experience, but just ordinary people, followers of Jesus. Truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. The first level of meaning is that Jesus wants his followers to do exactly what he did. He expects us to open the eyes of the blind. He expects us to unstop deaf ears. He expects us to invite the lame to walk. He expects us to heal the sick, demons to be cast out, and dead people to be raised back to life. What a shocking invitation this is. How are we going to do this? This is what Jesus said. Anyone who believes in me can do the same thing that I did. If you have enough faith to ask Jesus to save you, you have enough faith to do the works that Jesus did. Do what Jesus did by speaking to diseases and illnesses the same way that Jesus did. So I say now, eyes be open. You're watching me. Ears be open. Lame legs work. Get up and walk now in the name of Jesus. Cancer go right now in Jesus' name. Disease go. Stand up straight with your bent over back. You don't have to know a fancy prayer. The shortest prayers in the Bible are healing prayers. Never beg God for healing. It's yours. Just receive it.
This is how the first miracle that I know of that flowed out of my hands happened. It's a fascinating story. Some years ago, we had a relationship with a man who lived down on the water. He had a lot of parties at his house, and he and I became friends. He would have a Woodstock reenactment every year. I said, would you like our choir to come down and sing at your Woodstock reenactment? They invited us to sing for an hour because they were going to have 24 hours of music for all these days and all this ruckus going on. And we went down there and we did. God is able. A lady came up to me, drunk. I'd watched her hang on people. I had the sense she was trying to hang on me. And she said, would you pray for me? When a drunk person asks you to pray, there's something automatically inside of you that has some resistance. I'd said the simplest prayer I could pray and moved on. I never saw her again. Many years later, I was at a church across town on a healing team for a healing night. She came up after the service. She said, do you remember me? I, I think I remember you. Said, I was at such and such a house and I asked you to pray for me. I've not had a drop of alcohol since you prayed for me. Would it be safe to say I had very low expectation? <laughs> I mean, is that fair? Did God use me in spite of my doubts that he could? It was just the words, powered by Jesus himself. He sobered her up and left her sober for a long time. I'm so glad I got to know that story because it changed how I believe about the text. The saying of Jesus happens naturally for people who read the Bible and simply believe what Jesus said. But if you have been taught that miracles aren't for today, then this text is a lot harder for you to believe. I'm asking you to let go of whoever taught you what, including whatever I taught you inappropriately about this text of Scripture and simply believe Jesus wants you to heal people the way he healed people. How is it possible for Jesus to do this? We've already learned that the faith that saves us is enough faith to heal. Jesus went on to say that we can expect to do more than he did. Come on, Jesus, really? Isn't it enough that I just try to come near you? Do you want me to pass you? Really, Jesus? Truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he or she do. John chapter 12, verse 14. There's no point speculating. You might not have reached the level of greater works than you think Jesus did, but today I'm inviting you to do greater works than you have done in the past. Greatness for you might be moving to your first healing, your first ears opening, your first eyes opening, your first cancer going. Just go up one more level and keep doing it. Keep talking to people. God's going to take you places. The devil wants you to get stuck on the phrase greater works. The devil is doing his best right now to have you think it's impossible for me to do greater works than Jesus did. Let's not let him do that. Jesus said, I can do greater works than he did. Say it with me. Jesus said, I can do greater works than he did. What does this mean? Let's start with what it does not mean. It does not mean that we are better than Jesus. It doesn't mean we're more powerful than Jesus. And it doesn't mean that we are greater than Jesus. So what does Jesus want us to understand about greater work? First of all, Jesus is referring to the works he did in the human form when he left the glory of heaven, took on the veil of a babe and the mantle of humanity. He is not expecting us to do the works he did in creation before the foundation of the world. He is expecting us to move in greater things than he was allowed to move in. Jesus came to do what the Father sent him to do. His ministry was limited by his primary mission that the Father gave to him. He made it clear. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. 
Christ. He came to give his life a ransom for many. We have ministered in this church for 58 years. Jesus just limited his time to three years, ending with his death, burial, and resurrection. His mission was to pay for the sins of the people of the world. His mission was not our mission. His mission was limited geographically. His mission was constrained by wherever he could walk to, and he walked to not more than 100 miles from where he was born. He raised three people from the dead. But I'm connected with ministries around the world that have raised more than 200 people from the dead. They're not better than Jesus, but they are doing greater works than Jesus did during his lifetime. His mission was not to show us what he can do. His mission was to show us what we can do. That's a sentence that changed my life. His mission was to launch the church. Our mission is to complete the task of spreading the good news of Jesus to every tribe, tongue, and nation around the world. Our mission has no limits until he returns. We're to use every means possible by print media to satellites from bicycles to jets. Your pastor's flown around the world 10 times. You've sent me around the world 10 times. I've visited 70 nations. We've reached over 75 million mobile devices in 185 nations. Our humble congregation has done far greater works than Jesus was able to do. But we've not done this by ourselves. We have done this because of what Jesus said. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. We're not doing these greater works by ourselves. We're doing them because Jesus is in heaven, praying for us, advocating on our behalf before the Father. He has given us permission to do the works that are greater than his by using his name. He is the one who releases the power to do greater works. We are using them and doing them by his name, not by ours. We're not the one who heals. He is the one who heals. And I will do whatever you ask in my name that the Son may bring glory to the Father and you may ask anything in my name and I will do it. John chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. I don't know of any other religious leader who promised his followers they could use his or her name to heal anyone. Jesus extended a powerful invitation to his followers, offering to use his name to heal people. We learn that power flows through us when we cultivate intimacy with the Father. The closer we come to Jesus, the closer we come to the Father. There are certain things I would never ask my dad to do because I know how my dad thinks. I respect my dad. I would never want to ask him to do something that would make him feel uncomfortable. When we are asking in Jesus' name, we're very mindful of what the Father will be comfortable about our request. Jesus knew the will of his Father, and he only did what he saw his Father doing. Moving in greater works requires intimacy with the Father. When we know what the Father wants, then we know what to ask for. I get so tired of hearing people say, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, and there's nothing behind it. There's no intimacy with the Father. It happens when we're walking in obedience to his ways and have an intimate relationship with him. I release to you the belief that you can ask anything that brings glory to God and you'll receive him. One thing that we have clearly seen in the life of Jesus is his healing grew out of his compassion for people. Over and over again, we read Jesus was moved with compassion by what he saw. I'm asking, Father, to increase your compassion for people. I feel compassion for people right now. I feel compassion for people who have growths. We've seen so many growths come off of people and boils. I was in Kenya praying for a lady, and she said she had a big growth out of her stomach. We prayed for her because it's out in the country. It said she just ran out in the cornfield to check her growth and came back. She said it's still there. We prayed again. We ran out. And she came back. She says it's half the size. That lady went out again a third time and didn't come back. 
<laughs> a long time later, I saw her back. I said, what happened? She said, it's gone. I command your growth in your stomach to go now in Jesus' name. I was in Turkey praying for a group of refugees. A man came up and he said, I've got a growth in my back. I didn't see it, didn't touch it. I just said, growth, go. And he just looked at me like, is that it? I said, put your hands behind your back. He put his hand behind his back and his eyes got bigger saucer because it was gone. I'm so glad Jesus said amen to me. And he wants to say amen to you. We feel compassion for people. Cancer, go now in Jesus' name. Deformed legs, be straightened out in Jesus' name. I didn't have the courage to do it. I've done it since then. Mr. Somehow you see me, be healed. Legs straighten out right now in the name of Jesus. We've seen four people get out of wheelchairs and walk. God can do anything, and he wants to do it through you. He wants to do it then more than the pastor. Pastor can't reach enough people. But you're in touch with people every day who need the healing presence of God. If you were just healed, would you write to me and let me know what God has just done for you? If you're not sure that you'll spend eternity with God in heaven, I invite you to follow the path that Jesus offered to all to accept that he died on the cross for your sins. He died for you in your place so that you can spend eternity with God in his presence. Thank Jesus for dying for you on the cross. Ask him to forgive you for all your sins. Commit your life to him. If you just received Jesus as your Savior, write to me and tell me about your decision to follow Jesus. If you received Jesus as your Savior or were healed while listening to this message, write to me and we'll send you more information to help you grow as a follower of Jesus. To hear all of this message, please visit my YouTube channel at Dr. Peter McLuhan. Join us next week for another Living Hope podcast.